Welcome to Moby Mondays. My name is Rael Jackson. I am a Moby Advisory Board member as well as the program manager for Real Men Charities. Um, thank you for joining this Moby Mondays episode. What's said about race at work? If this is your first time attending a Moby Mondays show, we are marketing opportunities in business and entertainment. We host the annual Moby Symposium Advanced Marketing Conference and the Moby Mondays virtual series, which airs bi-weekly on Facebook and YouTube on the Moby Symposium page. Um, before we get started, I, I want to um, send our prayers to Shaka Zulu, um, the manager of Ludacris, who is a, is a former um, panelist on a Moby Symposium um, panel. Uh, we want you to get well. Um, since we last met, uh, we've had Real Men Cook, our Father's Day, our annual Father's Day event. Uh, we were able to welcome Mayor Lori Lightfoot as well as Superintendent, Chicago Police Superintendent um, Brown. And uh, we've had a landmark case um, by the Supreme Court um, of abortion. You know, a lot of things are going, have happened since we last met. Um, you know, just want to send my condolences to anybody who is dealing with any, any problems, any issues. You know, our prayers are with you. We want the best. Uh, Moby is an arm of Real Men Charities, which produces uh, Real Men Cook. Uh, which just, we just celebrated 33 years. Um, you can you can visit Moby at mobysymposium.com and on all social media at Moby Symposium. We ask that you go there and you know like us, share this share this information with your friends. Um, it's very important. Our host today is D.D. Lofton Davis. D.D. is an award-winning racial equity advisor a writer, a lecturer, and in a few days on July 1st, she will start a new position as the first executive director of anti-racism and equity for the South Burlington, Vermont School District. Dee Dee is a recipient of the Women of Change Award for Racial Equity from Lincoln University in 2019. Uh, please welcome Dee Dee Lofton Davis, our moderator for today. Shout out Lincoln and Vermont. <laughs> and the floor is yours, Dee. Thank you very much. And I want to say hello, Facebook, YouTube, StreamYard family. Hit us up with questions as we go along. Last time we were on here, you gave us 50 questions in the last five minutes. Don't get mad at me. Keep it going. If you have no questions, that means it's kind of getting kind of good because you guys are listening. So I appreciate it. either way. Thank you all for showing up here. We really appreciate it. With the world on fire now and America on fire because of Roe versus Wade, uh, Roe versus Wade decision, um, I appreciate you guys just taking a little bit of your time, you know, to be here with us. So let's get to it. All right, I'm not gonna waste anyone's time tonight. Let's talk to Mr. Richard Louis. Richard Louis is a veteran journalist with more than 30 years, y'all. Listen to this. In television, film, technology, and business, he has op-eds op in USA Today, Political, Politico, San Francisco Chronicles, and others. And he's currently an anchor journalist on NBC, MSNBC News, and previously at CNN Worldwide. He is, you mentioned I'm the first, he also is the first Asian American male to anchor a daily news program. On top of that, this man got 20 jobs, y'all, okay? On top of that, <laughs> he's a best-selling author. He's a Peabody winner. And the list goes on, but we don't have time. Google him and find out this one is a real one. He's a real <laughs> one. All right, so thank you, Richard, for being here. You pronounce it Richard Louie, is that correct? Yeah, thanks, Dee Dee. It's, it's not a lot of jobs. It's a lot of side hustles. <laughs> Welcome to, to the Black Women's World. <laughs> Great to have you. Well, let's get right into it. I want to talk about your personal journey first, you know, before we go into all of um, the professional um, aspects of your career and your work that you're doing now, which is amazing. Let's talk about, I, I remember you had a quote where you said, um, in the last year, there were over 200,000 Asian babies that were born in America. And you say that, you know, your community is not a monolith. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, um, 
the and thanks dd for hosting this and thank you to to moby and thank you rael uh, and the entire team with uh, the moby symposium and, and moby mondays and we get to be here and get get uh, very frank right very real about a lot of topics and and one of them was um the reason why i was i was thinking about those hundreds of thousands of babies that were born in the last year was because it was also a year of the most recorded incidents of hate incidents right so the and and that was just shocking to me and i, I was thinking you know what's going to drive me uh the api community the communities of color america to think about it in a way that might be different than before and the thing was would we let any group of kids born not remember something that's defining who they are based on their the, the, the color of their skin and it, it it comes from a long history uh that the symposium knows very very well and digs into and it's something that relatively for the api community it's lived through it but does it have the same institutional or community knowledge right and it's it's very it's very early stage. It was a member of the API community. It's very early stage of understanding what it means to be a person of color. And for me being a man of color, right? And so looking at the number of babies that were born that happened to look like me and what they need to know in 10 years when they're in middle school or, or 15 years when they're in high school, what are the messages? What are the things we got to build today? So in 10 to 15 years, they have some vision and they can see back and see what, where, what brought them. Because that's the thing that my eyes kind of opened up in the last year or two after uh, Atlanta and the spa shootings. It just opened my eyes. And I, I, I really had to rethink again mm -hmm. what brought me. I love how you bring in uh, the younger generation and the younger Asian community as and you want to be a mentor and, and those in your generation want to basically help them navigate all of this. And, and especially when it comes to anti-Asian racism, um, I want to touch on your beloved father. You know, um, I believe he was born here in San Francisco, yep. um, worked hard all of his life and productive American citizen, uh, raised a family, uh, uh, war running journalists and side hustles plus. Uh, <laughs> and despite all of that, um, he still, and to this day, currently 2022, faced and faces Asian hate so much so he was pushed down um, during um, not just one, but several um, of uh, the Asian, um, anti Asian black sentiment that's been going on ever since, um, even before Trump, but more so after Trump's presidency. Um, he was pushed down to the ground at his age. Um, uh, can you share more about his background and, and more about, you know, how he's, you know, basically self, you know, care, how he's healing, how your family is handling this? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting when I was talking about like what brought me and I continually learn more DD as time goes by that I, you know what, you heard it in your family, your parents said it, but did you really hear it? Did you really take it inside? And for my father who uh, wanted to become a pastor, and um, this is very important to me about what, what brought me because I realized when I w attended my first Men of Color event um, earlier this year at Binghamton University, that there was a certain um, brotherhood between my father and people he did not know but I didn't see it until recently. And, um, you know, why become a pastor, a man of color, Asian American, um, what, 65 years ago, who else was there? Like I look at his graduation picture, Didi, there was like 500 people and like two Asian guys in the bottom corner. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah, did he get lost? I mean, was, was he just walking along like, Hey, picture, you know, and kept on walking. <laughs> But it, I realized after thinking about it, because as he lived through Alzheimer's, there were certain things that he just held on to, right? Because you hold on to certain things. One of the things he held on to, well, was this 
award that he got at Glide Memorial in San Francisco, which is a church that serves the Tenderloin in San Francisco, um, which is a an area that has a, a lot of, uh, of, of individuals who don't have a place to stay, who cannot get a good meal, and, and others. You know, it's a very intersectional community. And Cecil Williams has been the pastor there for decades, was there for decades. And my father, I think, he got that award. It was the Martin Luther King Award and yes. Service Award. And I remember when he got it, he was calling me, DD. He was, and I, I'd go home because I live in New York and he's in San Francisco. I'd go home and he'd mention it again. He'd come over here. Look, see, see, see back there? That's, that's that award I got. See, I said, Dad, you, you've been telling me like five times. And it then one plus one brought it together. When he was deciding whether he could become a pastor, I know there was another man of color that proved to him he could do it. You know, who, how, how was he able to? And it was the award that he remembered last. In fact, he passed in December. And, and the award that we brought, the things that you, we brought to his, um, his care home, because his Alzheimer's advanced. So my mom could no longer, we as a family could no longer take care of him. It was that award that we brought there because we knew it meant so much to him. Mm. There's like five things. One of them was his MLK award that he got from Glide Memorial. And the reason why I knew that the, the way that we can help each other was so important for him was he changed, he was a Republican and he changed parties when there was an, a candidate that was also a man of color. Wow. And also That's a pastor. Huge. Yeah, 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 yeah. In this day, wow. Yeah, this is, but this is a, this is a couple of minutes ago, Dee Dee. This is, uh, this is when uh, an another reverend came into the picture. And so when Jesse Jackson ran for president, my dad mm -hmm. changed parties and voted for him. He never looked back, right? Mm. And that is, I think, when we look at what you were commenting on about the Asian and black communities and how they are together and, and how they, they, they overlap in, in a lot of places in America, that for my father, it was a very big influence for him about major decisions in his life. And so when I was at the Men of Color event in Binghamton, I think that what we sometimes forget is the power of which one community can give to another community of color and the way they can invigorate them. And there's a certain understanding and, and, and things you don't need to say, but you see it and you go, mm, see, he did that. I must try to do the same. And my dad lived it. But I didn't realize a lot of these things, Dee, Dee, except for later in life. So the responsibility, I think, of looking at what brought our parents and what brought us is so instructive. And um, I cannot help. But if what if my dad didn't have those mentors? Right. He, he never met them. Um, and so when I was interviewing uh, Jesse Jackson and I, he was a guest over at 30 Rock. I actually, I, I don't ever do this, Dee. Dee. But I, I brought out a piece of paper and it was just I literally I just grabbed a, a script, turned it over and I said, Reverend Jackson, I never ask anybody for for autographs. Never, never done it. Only one time. And I said, can, can you write a note to my dad? He is in his uh, uh, I think my dad was in his sixth year of Alzheimer's then. And I said, can you write a note to my dad? Because you you're the reason why he became not only a Democrat, but that he cared so much about your candidacy as a man of color that he upped and changed his life, you know, to do this. So he wrote the note. I put it in a Ziploc bag, whoop, put it inside my, my backpack, got home, gave it to my dad. And at that time he goes, he reads it and he goes, who's Jesse Jackson? Mm. And that's how I knew that his Alzheimer's had advanced. Yeah. Yeah. Because these are these things were so important to him. It was bittersweet, if you know what I mean. Definitely, and that's that. That is so beautiful, and it's amazing how it took someone outside of his community. Um, that's right. Still faced uh, racism, 
in our case, of course, anti-Black racism. And shout out to Jesse Jackson and all the work that he has done. Remember the Rainbow Coalition that was started back in the 80s and we thought we were going to kind of party and, you know, and then take off. And because it wasn't supported, people didn't think it was um, important enough to vote. And That's so, right. you know, thank you know, I'm always thankful for social media because I think social media has heightened the and especially over the weekend, the the need, the desperation for us to vote. Young people, if you're listening, older people, if you're listening, those who just are getting into uh, politics and understanding what your vote really means. Our democracy really is at stake. And your father knew and Jesse Jackson knew back then in the 80s, so much so that he changed not only his political philosophy, but his worldview. So that's huge. It um, was. It was. Yeah. Yeah. There's always I'm, I'm always amazed. And, and, and it's accurate as well. There's always so much said about. Um, the Asian community versus the black community. And it's always players who are outside of our community yeah. um, that speak disparagingly of it. And That's we know right. about, you know, I know um, us to know about inter-minority racism. That might be a new word for some of you all, but inter-minority racism basically is built on a raci racist racial caste system back in the 90s where, you know, there was a lot of more um, Asian community coming in business-wise in China, of course, getting involved. When it came to a dominant race, the white um, dominant race, when it came to business, um, you were your community was dubbed the um, model minority. And so the black community and the brown community, South Asians and Hispanics and Native Americans were pushed back. And they put, you know, business wise, the Asian, lighter skinned Asians on a pedestal. And it was people like your dad who said, no, we're not going to go that route. I'm not going to teach my children that. Yeah. I'm going to show them that we are equal, we are together, and we're even stronger in unity together. I'm so glad that you are, congratulations on your, your new position. I'm so glad you're doing that because you. you've perfectly, Dee Dee, laid out the theory, right? The stereotype that there is this model minority, which is uh, for knuckleheads. Yes. Uh, because yes. there is. <laughs> yes. there, there are, what it is. That's what right. Is. There, there, there is no model minority. It is pitting one group against another so that the, the unfortunate racially charged and racist thematics that, that exist around us are saying, well, if you two fight each other, then we're good. And those ideas are so wrong. Um, and, you know, because the idea of a model minority, um, Asians are, I mean, I, so in New York City, the, the group that lives in poverty at the highest rate are Asian American Pacific Islanders at, at 25%. And many people don't know that, that it is no. Asians. People, you know, and, and I get, you know, Hollywood highlighting the movie Crazy Rich Asians, but that's not, I see exactly, react and love it. That's not the reality of many people in your community. Um, no. It's just the Hollywood version of what your community is, adding to the racist narrative of the model Asian, you know, myth, minority myth. Yes. And, you know, 50% of Asian American Pacific Islanders go to community college. They don't go to Harvard. Yeah. But well, you know what's happening is, Dee Dee, is there's an upper sort of like 2 to 5% that is making all, look, it's just what it is, the statistics, is overweighting the statistics. You know, when I grew up and didn't have enough food, and that's, a, that's an experience for many communities of color, and we thanks to the welfare system. And, and you and I have had a couple chuckles about this. Yes, but we, we both grew up on welfare. I mean, I remember government cheese was my life. Every single, yes. you know, first of the month, you couldn't tell me nothing. Had my grilled cheese, my That's tomato right. soup, my food stamps. I'm like six years old saying, yes, my first ice cream this month and I'm good to go. That's why I'm fat yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. But yes, we love our block cheese. Yes. We love our mac and cheese. We love our canned meat, whatever that canned meat is. All processed stuff that you wouldn't give to a dog because you love them too much. <laughs> That's right. I love it. I love it. And now everybody, you know. So the thing is, I didn't know any different. That was just my experience. And so it took a while to understand, first of all, this model minority myth is fully, fully for knuckleheads. 
because um, it just pits us against each other when really it shouldn't be that we're fighting for the same block of cheese. It's just the wrong way to look at it. You know, so when businesses say, I give $100 for all the ERGs, for the black ERG, the Latino ERG, the Asian ERG, the native ERG, and the women's ERG, and you, you have to divide it up. That's not the right way to look at it because that reinforces what we see in outside work. Outside work, we think it's the same one block of cheese, and it's not. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And exactly. All right. Our injustice um, realities, our histories are so um, immersed and so similar and so parallel in each other. You know, when that happened with the modern minority, because on the same, on, on the other end of the spectrum, going back, and I'm a, I'm a student of history. I guess I'm a history buff. My, my husband calls me his favorite history nerd because I, I want to get the facts, but not the facts according to white history or the dominant history, but the facts according to history, listening to the news or listening yes. to relatives tell me about it. And while you're, you know, dealing with the model minority, going back to the 80s, okay, okay, kids, you know, come up to the computer. I'm like, you know. <laughs> Let's learn a little bit tonight, okay? You can do this <laughs> later, okay? And, and you can tell me, like, you know, about it later. But um, back in the 80s and 90s, after, you know, especially 80s, civil rights. Um, and when, you know, that happened and there was a push to see more black men in corporate America. And back in the 80s, we know how misogynistic and how sexist um, the culture was, the work culture was in C-suite and even in business. And mm -hmm. so many businesses and C-suite began to pit the black man against the black woman. And we were like the foundation of our community. Black families were. Mm. And when they did that, that gave economic um, elevation to black men. And then they demonized and that and, and the Reagan generation and, and that politics demonized black women and called us welfare moms when the reality was they were more white women on welfare than black women. So, of course, in the 90s, we leveled up because we didn't like that narrative. And shout out to the HBCUs who spearheaded this. We began to, began to get our education. We began to get our doctorates. We began to get our masters, our bachelors, our associates. And even then, back then, we still were not considered good enough to come to the so-called, you know, table. So what you were facing on that model minority myth, black women were facing that, um, and black men were facing being tokenized because look, we hired a black man. We're not same idea. Ha ha. Same idea. So inter-minority racism pitting each other, black and Asian community against each other, while we're both suffering from the racism, um, is a whole nother conversation. Um, but I, I want to highlight how similar our experiences are, just at you know, just in different communities because of white supremacy, because of um, anti-black and Asian racism, because of inter-minority racism. And now it's so poisoned that there are many people who, I didn't say many, I just say under 10% of black and brown, um, according to um, a couple of um, Citibank, Citigroup, um, and also um, McKinsey, um, who subscribe to a, a mindset of white supremacy culture or align themselves with um, whiteness. You know, and it's not to demonize white people or the white community. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to uprooting systems and structures. I'm calling uh, that out. That's what we have right now with what's going on with Roe versus Wade. That is a system and a structure that was placed a long time ago. And now we're seeing the fruition of people who never should have had power. Black and brown faces and white faces joined together in the Republican Party saying, women, our guns are more important than your bodies and your choice. And building on that, Dee Dee, and I know I'm, I'm dragging dragging out the clock here. I apologize, but no, no worries. There's the informal systems that are also in flux. You know, when I first started reporting, one of one of the first stories I remember is Rodney King as a cub reporter, as a young yes. reporter. Yeah, I I had to report on a black man on tape being beaten with billy clubs and kicked. And you know, as a young reporter, you don't quite know. What are the words you use? It's just yeah. too much, too much. Here we have a human on the ground in my home state of California. And then when it moved to reporting in the streets for Michael Brown in Ferguson, where I spent weeks, 
And I had to look back 20, 25 years. And I was, I was often, let's say you're the anchor. I would say to the anchor on the third question, I would say, you know, we have to make note that if for those who are watching time, it's been 25 years and we're seeing the same thing that we saw when I started as a young reporter. And so anchor DD, I think we have a, a moment that we really must think twice yes. about what is happening. And then Freddie Gray and then George Floyd. And every single time I'm standing in the street, I'm t telling the same story. And over 25 I'm, years. Over 30 years. Yes. And so I am I am so grateful for my boss, Yvette Miley, who who felt that I could share the story of what it meant to be a reporter of color to bring in the perspectives of all of us and as well individually. And that was so empowering to me. Again, another leader of color who understood how there's a certain benefit to getting them out and that you can offer a voice. Just as I was mentioning earlier for my father, certain voices that were teaching him that we can also express uh, ideas and thematics that are deep as well as wide in ways that maybe if you didn't select a person of color, maybe a little bit different. It's not one or the other. It's just what's best for the story. And I think the one thing that I take away from that and why I wanted to get into the informal structures that build communities is that during George Floyd, we didn't see the elders. We're at an inflection point. You know, the elders have a lot of lessons yes, on yeah. how to get it done right. You know, when I was in the streets reporting on this, I always saw the elders walking in front. And every single- With their canes, with their walkers, with their arthritis and every itis you could think of. That's right. And when it was, when it was Michael Brown, a little bit of gray. Freddie Gray, a little bit more gray. George Floyd, they weren't there. And so I think we really have to, you know, we have to think about, well, how do we keep these lessons going? Because there's a lot of great lessons. They taught us how to work together. They taught us how to work together. Agreed. And, and they didn't write it down necessarily. You know what I mean, Didi, right? They didn't, yes. they didn't, they didn't say, here's the play. Conversations going over here to this potluck dinner. There was no social media. That's right. No, like me here on TikTok, none of that. It was just like a neighborhood knocking on the door back in the day. That's right. And when I stood next to Reverend Lowry in Atlanta, and you know, if you if you saw him, and for those of you who know him, and you've certainly watched him speak, but he, he he's not a tall individual. He was not a tall individual. And when you meet him, he's just, hello, how are you? Good to see you. And then I remember when I introduced him, I was like, oh, I'm not sure because I not I didn't know who he was. And shame on me. Shame on me. I did not know. I mean, I knew his pastor and said civil rights era, you know, and he was very quiet. We had a little step for him. So I pulled out the step. He got up and he was like very quiet. And then thunder came down from the sky <laughs> after that. It was just like, wow. And he's gone. Yeah. And there's yeah. so many others that we need to figure out what are the lessons? Because during George Floyd, they weren't able to go out and they will not. In unfortunate, we're going to have more reasons to take up our great American tradition and we will walk and we will march for the right stuff. And right. when they're not there, you know, I'm, I'm myself as a, as a proud uh, American of color will wonder what are, what do we do? Right. How do I hand, because every one of these are a little bit different, right, Dee? Yeah. Everyone's a little different. But you know, if you talk to one of the elders and Reverend Sharpton, I am not calling you an elder, but <laughs> when I, when I talk, what's that? Shout out to Reverend Al. <laughs> yeah. And I see him every weekend and I talk to him and like, I, I feel like I'm just learning by being with, because you know, there's a, yes, yes. So we got, we have an informal system that we got to, we got to get as much as we can because it's going to be different in only a matter of years. They won't be always with us. And, and it's so true. We're standing on, 
on magnificent shoulders because they've seen what we're seeing now. They've been to where we're going. And if we are to ignore them, dismiss them, ignore them, and, and just placate them, we're losing out because we're going to become the elders of someone else you know, someday if we're fortunate to live. And if we don't have our lessons learned, we're just gonna keep on repeating the past. Our, our elders got it right during civil rights. They got it right during abolition. They got it right during so many other mag movements. I hate to say mag, but magnificent movements that really took our, and, and is taking our community black and brown um, forward. Now you mentioned lessons and I, I go back to the, to your, to your beloved father who taught you those lessons, but you didn't just listen to the lessons, you actually put it in a survey. Let's get into your survey. Yeah. Um, I want, and and, it's, and it's, it's an important survey, it's an extensive survey. So with our time remaining, which is getting short, and, and I appreciate you know all that you've done, I wanna highlight you know at least a, a, a lot of the survey. Um, and I know it's still going on, I believe as well. But what was the catalyst, first of all, for the survey? So there have been studies about what it means to be a person of color or what race at work is about. Um, but I didn't think after looking at all the different ones from the names you know, that they were being real enough, that they weren't being real in a way that if you and I were to go to talk to the CEO or go to the boardroom, that it was frank enough, it was direct enough to say, you got to do this and you got to do more. Yeah, we know it's good, right? Our, our tummy says, yeah, it's, it's the right thing to do. And even more than ever, you're seeing chief diversity officers in companies that have never seen one before, right? Chief inclusion officers, executive directors of educational institutions, GD, Lockheed Davis. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you for that. I received that. Right. That's right. Throwing it over at you. And so that's, that is a change. And what is needed is more data to say, don't react just based on George Floyd. React because the data tells you it's right, and it does. And it also tells you how to then act as opposed to just act. And I started in, in, in working not in journalism, but on industry side. So I was just trying to put the two things together, you know, because business has this amazing power, as you know, to change yes. the way we, we think and what we do. They don't tell us what to do, but we do spend a lot of time at work. And so what inspired me to try to, to do this, and we brought in uh, Momentum, and we brought in API Data, and we brought in Dr. Karthik Ramakrishnan, and Dr. Pilene Kesabir, and we're working with Sherm as well on this, is we wanted to get data that was good, newsworthy data, and data that was real in your face that you could take to your chief diversity officer and your chief diversity officer can, can take it to the CEO and say, see, this is what it is. We better move and we better move. You have to move a real, have to a real study, not like a Google Doc or Google Form. No. Y'all went all in and you got firm right. and you got the data. Okay. Yeah, and it's not, as you know, and I, I can, yes. it, it's, it's not easy. It's not inexpensive, but we got to do it. We got to We got to take what has already happened the last two years and keep the momentum going. I agree. And, and, and speaking to uh, the survey, now the population um, in which the survey is about, you know, it's from all cultures and races and backgrounds. Um, let's talk about some of the findings as it pertains to um, the participants' career goals um, and as it pertains to race and racism. Um, do, you, do you find that race and racism played a huge part? Um, whether it being something that was a that was holding uh, their career from advancing, um, was that discussed um, when the survey uh, or the study came up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had to ask questions just like that. Do you think because you are a black woman, you are an Asian man, that that makes it harder for you to get your where you want to go in your career? Do you think so? Uh, yes, every day. Every yeah. day, not just right. in a career, just walking down the street. <laughs> you know, I have to be unbothered and keep it moving and still in advance. 
and that is so we, the, the study was conducted across all uh, racial groups. And we the, the studies that we do, we have the black American worker, we have the Latino American worker, we have the Asian American worker, we have the Native American worker, we have the, the female worker, we have workers. So these are the way the studies are broken out. When it comes to the question of my race or ethnicity makes it tougher for me to get to where I want to go in the company. Now, when it comes to just about every worker of color, the number is either one in four or two in five that believes, yes, it will hold me back because I have this. That's a large number. And that's oh, that's way too many. That we're, that's yeah. way, way too many. Yes. And it is, it is double that of those who are not of color. And so we have a, we have an, we have our perceptions of who we are is reality to us that we really, now, if you're going to the corner office, you can say, see, we have an issue here because all of your workers of color, you know, whether it's a quarter or a third believe that because they are people of color, workers of color, that they can't achieve their career goals. And whether it is real or not for the moment, right, Didi? The issue is you do have a gap. If you're leading a business, you've got a gap there, especially in your non- And disconnect, if you will. What's that? A disconnect, right. Yeah, but whatever it is, it could be a disconnect, it could be reality, it could be something in between, it could be both. And if the rate is twice that of non-workers of color, you got some opportunity. If I were to glass half full it there, glass half full it, you got some opportunity as a leader of a business. And if you're CEO and I, I take it to you, DD, you know, you're going to look at that and go, okay, well, that, well, you know what that is? When, when I first push that piece of paper across to you, you're going, okay, well, that's just one. Yeah. That's, that's we're just, just starting a conversation right at that point. Yeah. That's yeah. just one. But now, there's I more. Find- Exactly. I, I, your study is just, and I've seen part of it, and it's amazing. I can't wait till you publish it because it's such not just needed information, it's relevant. And also, it's real information. You know, you know, no diss to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but that's where I believe the disconnect is. Race and racism. That's what really, you know, even just in my lived experience is what Black and brown people want to know about the company. You know, how do you address race and racism? Is it just basically a form you send to HR and you never see it again? Or is the person that is the offender of racism getting a slap on the wrist and you have to report to that person knowing that you reported it and nothing was done? And we talk about now the great you know, resignation, a big driver of that has been about race and racism Um, because people are tired. I know back in the day, my mom always taught me, you know, if your company is not doing you right, then you start your own. And entrepreneurship is really big. It's huge, especially in with black women. And it has helped, you know, many other black and brown people. That's how many people who even came, immigrants came into the country, started with their own business. Entrepreneurship is the way out of um, financial debt. And that being said, companies now are talking about, you know, how do we, you know, recruit and, and how do we retain, you know, talented, gifted, you know, black and brown uh, talent. And I'm always saying, well, how do you approach race and racism in your company? You know, it's, it's not hard to attract us. There's no pipeline problem. We black, we brown, we're here all day and we're professional. We have our degrees, we have our experience. You know, we have all of that. It's hard keeping us there. So how does your study um, approach that? And what were your findings on retention yeah. and recruitment? Yeah, so that's, that's a, a really big one because when it comes to, and, and I'll get to retention in a second, and because it, that's, a, that's a real number. Um, we ask the question of all employees, uh, do you think racial issues cost your company? Because, you know, for a while, industry, you, it wasn't a place you would go and talk about race. You wouldn't. Um, and so, therefore, culturally, or when you're talking about in the boardroom, are you thinking about, well, all this is happening outside of our business, right? All of this around the country and the world is happening. 
oh, but we're a business. That's not what we deal with, right? That that was a stereotype of of business. You will be shocked at the number we found that believe that racial issues cost their company. These are workers. When you look at Black American workers, it is close to 65% wow. that say it cost our company. Asian Americans, 55%. Wow, more than half. That's right. And on average, we're talking about more than half. You know, it's interesting. I, I remember seeing a study a um, couple years ago. It's the most recent study on race um, by Citigroup, I believe. Um, and it came out on NPR. It came out on all the you know mainline stations as well um, that uh, racism unaddressed racism um, cost the U.S. economy over $16 trillion. And your study speaks to that. And it, and it goes on, it goes along with that, how people it feel, does. About, how people feel about this company's not addressing race and racism. And, and we, companies. And we asked them, how much does it cost your company in revenue? Six to 8%. Now, my friends, if you can increase revenue by six to 8%, by reducing racial issues first first of all it's just the right thing to do right yes. but if you if if you can increase that your revenue by 6 to 8% golly that makes a lot of difference and on top of that we also ask the question what is the value to you of an effective inclusion culture inclusive culture at your business let's just say we can let's say we can improve the inclusive culture at your business by 50%. What's that worth to you in your salary? And what we heard was also 7, 7.5% 7 in, in salary. Can you imagine that? If I spent even 1% of your salary on an inclusive culture to improve it by 50%, I see it as being seven times the value of that. So if you're leading a company and your employees think an inclusive culture is worth seven, eight percent of my of my salary, well, that's again, double down on it. Do more programs, more ERGs, more BRGs, more training, more, more, more cultural events, right? Bring it, bring people together. Cause they're they're valuing it. They're putting real dollars on it. And that's one of those questions, Didi, that you were asking earlier, what's the real, real? And those are the dollars. Dollars are real. You know, it's amazing because there's, at this point from all the studies out there, you know, diversity and inclusion is a um, annually a billion dollar career. And again, no uh, diss to diversity and inclusion, but the mindset, at least within my community, many in my community, the black community, it's just like diversity and, and inclusion haven't done anything to move uh, us forward. And yes. after that, it has not done anything to really address the wage gap because you can sit yeah. with one person as chief diversity officer that looks like us in um, C-suite and, and pay them a million or half a million dollars a year. But there's over 40 million black people. That's yeah. one <laughs> of us. How is that yeah. going to help, you know, the overall, you know, bottom line for those who are frontline workers and shout out to those who are working during COVID who kept, who kept America afloat, black and brown faces, you know, who put their lives online, you know, going, you know, and, and even with healthcare, you know, helping to make sure that our country, who does not respect us economically, does not respect us humanely, does not respect us, you know, with their dollars, still did that. So, how does your study address that as well? Oh boy, that's uh, it's almost like you're. Re I didn't, I didn't uh, necessarily dig too deep on this before, but you hit on one question that when I first got the data, I was scratching my head because it, it, the first study we did was a Black American worker, and we said how. Do you think in DEI programming helps the situation when it comes to race in your business? Does it help your company? Does it help you or does it work against it? And in the Black American Worker Survey, it was 50 plus percent saying it's 
it helps me, it helps the company and and helps our community. But the interesting thing was we had about 40, I don't have the number right here on my fingertips, but I remember it was 40, 43% that said it made zero, it was not negative. It was just right down the middle, no difference. And I was sitting there, Didi, going, wait, isn't it going to be either it helps us or it doesn't help us, these, these DEI programs? But you're exactly right. Yeah, they weren't saying it. we call it diversity, at least in the black community, many of us call it diversity and exclusion because yeah. because we have the data now. COVID gave us two years of data rich information. And we found out that white women like affirmative action were the face and also the beneficiaries financially of diversity and inclusion. And then, of course, after that, you know, Asian, Hispanic and black were kind of similar. And then, of course, Native American, maybe two percent. So when the 40 that you serve, the 40 percent that you serve say that, I think, thank God they were honest. Because yeah. there are workers who are so traumatized just trying to feed their family. They don't even want to talk about race because they don't really trust leadership to really address it. And I, I can't fault them for it because they haven't yeah. seen it since affirmative action, since civil rights in the workplace. Because we see right now still the um, women make, and especially black and brown women, uh, make less on the dollar than black and brown men. And, and and again, you line up with like, you know, white and we, female and white men and white female now are, you know, um, passing white men in salary. So when you have diversity and inclusion, it's a billion dollar business, but black and brown people have yet to see part of that pie as a community. Yes, a lot of skepticism. So I appreciate your studies, my point, how you really are getting to the meat of the matter. You're talking about racism. It's not taboo anymore because the social media and COVID broke us out of that. Um, it's it, more so how are you going to address it? Everyone's anti-racist now. I've been there for 20 years, but I'm like, great, you're anti-racist, wonderful. You know, but what are you going to do about it? I love how you really are doing something about it through surveys, through um, talking to people who live experiences and putting it down for people to actually see it. But would you think, Dee, that 40 to 43% are saying, oh, it's uh, diversity and inclusion programs don't help us, but they don't hurt us. They make no difference. Okay, and, so and that, me, that you see, you see let me, that. Let me preface my answer because I have I, I think of some of my, my family and relatives, and I, I think of my um, my my aunt and uncle saying, you know, he working for a company. He's like, babe, baby, I, I got this survey uh, from corporate about race and racism. That right there shocked me. I've worked with the company for thirty years, um, so um, I'm just going to tell them what they want to hear. So when you say 60%, that could be some, uh, some uncles and aunts who are just saying, I'm going to tell them to keep my job, you know, play that role. Yes. You know, because I, I don't blame them for it because they, that's, they're feeding their kids, they're paying their mortgages, they're paying their taxes, you know, and are productive citizens who yeah. are not going to be honest because they see by reporting racism, they are the ones that are penalized. So I, yeah. I would say I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher because of that fear. It, it, okay, so yeah. so that's that's okay. I want to bring this data point up because I I brought this in my little lunchbox, um, and right. that was <laughs> how comfortable do you feel about talking about race at work? Oh, right, I'm very comfortable. That's my career, but many people yeah. who are not. Yeah, I, but we ask that question. I don't fault them for it. We ask that question. It's seen. Now, look, I'm not there to measure people, Dee Dee, but I it this was a this was a little surprising to me but asian american and black american workers said the, oh, at the same rate that they feel uncomfortable wow and it was one in four and that that was a little surprising for me because you know look i i know the stereotype of asian american pacific islanders that you know i thought it would be higher right like way higher like one in two <laughs> But it was, and and I from from just my experience, I figured it. But no, the thing about it is, when you have one in four people, that's just the way it is. And we're going to learn how to talk about it because you don't jump, you don't all of a sudden after George Floyd, you can set you and you say it was wrong. This involved racism, and then all of a sudden you are anointed with the ability to say and talk about race. 
you are not, right? There's one thing I learned is that I'm about a 15 year old um, Asian American Pacific Islander. Because 15 years ago, I realized I had to own looking like this when I would go on TV. Because I realized that's the first thing people would say. Oh, look at that Asian guy. He's on TV. Look, oh, look. He, he, and he speaks English. And, and look, he, he, he actually, now, none of the issues were about, oh, he asked good questions, uh, good research, uh, got the story right. It was, look at that guy. Even my mom, you know, look at, look at that. You know, it's, it's, it was, so I think that I get the fact that it's going to take time to feel comfortable fully about talking about this topic at work. And so the language arc that we need to learn to talk about it at work is so important, right? Because you don't all of a sudden, like it's with feminism, for instance, you, you, you don't say, you know, for some folks, if you use that word, it's like, oh, here we go. Um, and I realized that as I was speaking about feminism at um, uh, various financial institutions. And there was one time I even got cut off early. I was talking to 1,500 people, 2,000 people, big sales meeting, the biggest thing they ever do every year. And I was talking about feminism. That's what I was there to do as a male feminist. And all of a sudden I got And they cut me off early. They took a break. Look, I realized I was using the words that take some time to be earned and understood. And I think when it comes to feeling comfortable about talking about issues of race at work, now's the opportunity to teach the steps that you bring in the strength because it takes muscle tone, right? You have like you're 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 a you're a world champ when it comes to muscle tone on that DD, but you full well know that those of you will be teaching in your coming position is going to be, you're going to, you're going to work up to be the black belt, right? You're going to start with whatever it is in karate and you're going to work, work your way up so that you cause you're a black belt when it comes to talking about it, DEI, right? And that is a part that sometimes when we look at how the number of workers that are uncomfortable about talking about race at work, we, it's 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 part of it's part of training, right? And and to your point, well, at least it, what I do, the most the most time I spend normally even before I get into um, really the administrative part and 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 facilitating or teaching is a small component of it. But the biggest part is just dispelling um, the myths, uh, speaking to the fears, yes. yes, speaking to what they believe is. Mm -hmm. Truth and fact, I'll give you an example, hot button topic, CRT, um, you know, teaching in a majority 90% white state. Um, the first question is, well, you know, CRT, that can be taught to my kid, anti-racism. And they mention, of course, the four pillars right now of anti-racism with white fragility and Ibram X and, you know, and 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 Kimberly um, um, Crenshaw, God bless her, all them shout outs, they're doing great work. Um, but I always say, you know, first and foremost, do you do your research? Uh, CRT, first and foremost, is taught nowhere in uh, K through 12 education. Zero, zero. In fact, it's only taught uh, in college. And on top of that, it's only taught in law school, specifically Harvard Law School, and maybe one other might teach CRT. But again, it's in law school. But that's the biggest fear. And, and my concern is why are you so afraid of your child learning about the racist systems in our country? Why are you more afraid of that than addressing the lived experiences of people who are dealing with the racism that your child is learning about? And the way that these terms uh, are thrown around, right? Um, we have to disaggregate those terms. We have to make them real. Um, we have to not put them in a corner. And it takes time. It takes uh, money. It takes uh, a yes, lot money, of- Yes, effort. pay me. That's the first conversation. Pay equity, it, pay us you know, what our work deserves. Dee Dee Lofton Davis, LinkedIn, find her there. You can, you can get that done. Thank you. <laughs> you are part of the family. You are invited to everything <laughs> now. Okay. <laughs> my new brother. Yes, yes, yes. 
find him on LinkedIn as well. Definitely. <laughs> we have to wrap up soon. This conversation is so, it's, it's amazing. And every time we talk about race and racism, we always find the time just like, you know, becoming shorter and shorter, you know, but if you want to continue the conversation, once again, we look at the video, you know, go on Richard's uh, a LinkedIn page, watch MSNBC. He's there. Watch um, NBC um, News um, Worldwide. Of course, I'm on LinkedIn as well, and I, and I update on racial equity and anti-racism as well. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Dee Dee. And thank you, Rael. Thank you, Moby. Oh, thank you, Richard and Dee Dee. Uh, this was a great um, conversation. I think we need to talk more, especially um, amongst the groups that represent um, the United States. You know, we um, tend to, like you said, we tend to operate in these silos. And the only way that real change is going to come is together. So yeah. thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Didi. Uh, I'd like everybody to join us um, July 11th on our next Moby Monday show. Uh, we have an important show about mental health and athletes. Moby Chairman mm -hmm. at HBCU Go CEO Curtis Simons will lead the conversation with University of Maryland football star Charlie Wysocki and special guests about Charlie's bipolar disorder diagnosis and his 27-year journey to now live a stable life. Charlie has an amazing story to share to raise awareness about mental illness, and we look forward to seeing you here on July 11th. Have a safe 4th of July holiday, and we look forward uh, to seeing you at Moby Mondays. Please share this uh, with others. Click the share button, um, like our page, and you know we look forward to the next Moby Mondays. And thank you for everybody to tune in. Have a great evening.